Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Game Theater Con video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing lots of AMD stuff, because despite the company's Computex Press Conference being now over with, from its ashes lots of rumours and official information is still popping up. So we're going to be going through that very stuff in this video. And we're going to start things with Matisse aka Ryzen 3000. We'll start with some rumours and then we're going to move over compatibility between different processors, or rather processor generations and different motherboard generations. So the first thing we're going to go through is a clock speed information and a supposed anniversary chip that AMD are planning in the future. And this information comes to us via uh, Twitter on Bits and Chips uh, official Twitter account. I'll link to a, a couple of their posts in the description of this video. Obviously, these are rumors, so the information could turn out to be inaccurate. But according to him, he is very confident in his sources as well, as you would expect, otherwise he wouldn't be posting it. So first things first, AMD are allegedly having inferior yields with Zen 2 compared to the uh, previous Ryzen CPUs, so Zen and Zen Plus had better yields. Furthermore, uh, the reason the 16-core processors were delayed is naturally because of Intel, although honestly that didn't really require a source. As soon as AMD confirmed that we would only see up to uh, 16, uh, sorry, up to 12 cores, I think most of us realized that the rumors and uh, indeed what even I'd been told by my sources that AMD were considering holding back CPUs for both a marketing perspective and also for Canon Fire in case Intel did uh, release a major a new CPU architecture, like we don't know, of course, what um, Comet Lake is going to be capable of. So holding back a 16-core processor makes some sense there. Plus, as well, it just keeps the hype train going for anything to do with the 16-core CPU. So uh, according to uh, Bits and Ships, yes, that's one of the reasons that we didn't see a 16-core CPU. But there's also a couple other things. Uh, one is that we may actually see a 5 gigahertz 16 core processor, but it's for anniversary. This actually is to celebrate the launch of the 1 gigahertz Athlon back in the day. Uh, this is actually in March, so if you're thinking, well, golly gosh, I want to pick this processor up, you're going to have a long way to wait. It's essentially going to be 10 months wait. I would be actually curious if AMD did this. I mean, Intel have done it. They have released, of course, the 8086K. And then it wasn't like you had to wait six years for the 9900K to be launched. And now Intel are releasing the i9-9900KS, uh, which has a higher clock frequency. So companies doing this is not anything new. And obviously they can then go with better yield chips and then put those in, and obviously they're going to just able to naturally clock higher. But it's going to be really curious if that's true. Um, I'm also hearing some people whisper, and I have no idea of the validity of their um, sources, but there is some people whispering that the CPUs will be capable of overclocking in some situations, and indeed, there is a shop which will be selling highly binned Ryzen 3000 processors. So obviously Silicon Lottery there uh, really comes into play when you're overclocking. Whether, whether Ryzen 3000 is going to be highly overclockable, who the heck knows, to be honest. And personally, from my personal opinion, I would not be getting too invested in the idea of any Ryzen 3000 chips being just immediately capable of 5 gigahertz. I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't really get that much more room out of the tank. With that said, maybe they will be. Maybe they will be highly overclockable. And with any luck, that will be the case. So I also want to detail something I actually omitted uh, in the previous uh, coverage of Ryzen 3000 and the X570 platform, and that is backwards compatibility. I felt that uh, the video was already fairly lengthy, but a couple of people have actually been asking me about this, so I decided to just fling it in here really quickly. So if you own an A320 motherboard, you're just out of luck. You will not be able to use a third generation Ryzen CPU. That had been a long-standing rumour. Indeed, one of my sources had told me that this may be the case. 
but the B350 and X370 motherboards, they should run Ryzen 3000 processors, providing the motherboard vendor provides a BIOS update. So I would highly advise uh, before you pre-order your processor, make sure that the uh, motherboard vendor has or will release a BIOS for it. So whether that's Asus, MSI, and so on and so on, make certain that there is a BIOS available. And to their credit, most of these companies, I suspect, have or will release BIOSes. The 400 series, you're good. Uh, obviously, you probably will have to do a BIOS update, but still, generally, you're good. The curious thing, though, is if you have an X570 motherboard, you will not be able to plonk in a first generation Ryzen CPU. So if, for example, uh, you buy an X570 motherboard and let's say you buy an 8 core Ryzen 3000 CPU and you sell it and wait for the 16 core variants, which inevitably will eventually come, at least that's what the rumor is, um, and you happen to have, let's say, a 1600X, you can't just plunk that into the motherboard in the short time, it just will not work. So X570 will be incompatible with the first generation Ryzen. I'm not particularly that upset about that, but I'm just letting you know. Next up, I want to bring your attention to a really awesome transcript of an interview that is on PC World with Lisa Su and several other key personnel from AMD. I will focus primarily on ray tracing and graphics because there is a couple of very very interesting statements here that actually contradict things that we had thought was just well established at this point. But let's go through the interview. So first of all, a reporter asks Lisa about ray tracing. With ray tracing apparently being a big part of future consoles, is it going to be part of the new graphics architecture, RDNA? So we have a lot more RDNA content that David and Scott will be presenting. I think that some of you may be coming to our tech day in a few weeks at E3. We're going to be talking about all of that and we'll give out more information, says Scott Herkelman, uh, on all of the new features and technology. She also adds that we're definitely working on ray tracing. It's true, but like I said, we'll give you more of the roadmap at E3. A reporter also says that Given Sony has already announced ray tracing as part of the PlayStation 5, can you tell me if that's a Sony optimization or part of RDNA? Sue responds that we certainly have done specific optimizations for Sony, and they are a very deep customer for us on a semi custom product. There are optimizations there. However, we view ray tracing as a very important element across our portfolio. So we'll have ray tracing in a number of other places. Look at that, and you get to me to and you get to say more about ray tracing. And also David Wang adds, we started our RDNA development, and this I want you to really pay close attention to. He said, We have started our RDNA development before before the Sony engagement. RDNA is a revolutionary architecture. It's also very flexible. The reason I find that statement so very interesting is because a couple of websites, Forbes being the leader, I believe they broke the story first, that Narve was actually funded by Sony. So what uh, Lisa and her team there seems to uh, indicate is that this isn't true. Or at the very least, Narve had started in development and then Sony came later on with money. It's kind of curious. And another thing that's still unknown yet is how RDNA compares to GCN. So GCN has been around for a lot of time now. It started with like the 7950, 7970, and obviously then it evolved into the, the 200 series and the 300 series. We've seen Polaris, now we've got Vega, but all of them are iterations on GCN. Yes, there are improvements, but basically still GCN. Our DNA, uh, from what Lisa has said, is very different. Uh, there is significant changes under the hood compared to, let's say, Vega. But also, there are several uh, reports that 
there is still a lot of similarities between GCN and also RDNA. Some people are saying it's just basically renamed. I would not go as far as to say that, based upon what we've learned so far about the architecture. And admittedly, we don't exactly have a uh, block diagram and uh, full in-depth uh, details of what actually is going on with like the shaders or what have you. But it does look like there are some fundamental changes. However, it's interesting because uh, even a driver uh, entry, I believe it was on forenix.com, I think were the first ones to notice this, uh, they are actually still referencing Narve as GCN internally. So it's going to be really interesting to me exactly what differences there are between GCN and uh, RDNA because it's possible AMD are just trying to separate themselves from that naming scheme or they feel that it's such a departure from GCN although it's not a complete redesign of the architecture they feel it's far enough along or maybe there is really a complete and utterly different architecture. As for the um, ray tracing thing I've personally been told that uh, Narve the first generation does not have it but the second generation of Narve does have ray tracing. I actually broke that exclusive, but obviously this stuff could simply be wrong, and maybe that's the case, or possibly AMD have changed their plans last minute. But there's also a really interesting thing as well going around uh, from the website WCCF Tech, because they have actually managed to snag a little bit of information uh, from board partners, or rather AIBs, concerning Narve. According to their information, we will see two RX 5700 models, and these will be differentiated with the board power. They will be 225 watts and 180 watts, respectively. And they will, of course, use the 7nm RDNA architecture. The die, uh, which I believe it was Ryan over at... Uh, Anantech, yes, it was Ryan Smith over Anantech. He estimates the die from what he's measured in person to be around 275 mm squared. And the cards do use GDDR6 memory. There are several custom cards so far that have been displayed uh, by ASRock at Computex, and they do require two 8 pin power connectors. As a quick reminder of what we get with RDNA, we see a 1.5 times the performance per watt. 1.25 times the performance per clock, which is actually quite significant and will really play into things with the PlayStation 5. That is significant. And also, with consoles, T-flop to T-flop comparisons are just prevalent. For example, a lot of people are like, well, let's say the PlayStation 5 is like 12 T-flops to make it a nice round figure. Okay, well, that means it's twice as powerful as the Xbox One X then. Well, no, because once again, architecture makes a significant difference here. And if you have a 25% IPC gain, plus what other, other changes uh, Microsoft include on the, uh, the next generation Xbox or Sony include on the next generation PlayStation, after all, we don't know all of the custom enhancements yet, it could be significantly more than two times, plus the CPU as well. Anyway, uh, new compute unit design, obviously that does improve efficiency in IPC. Uh, much better caching as well, which will reduce the latency. This will help to offset the higher latency of GDDR6. Plus, just overall, in theory, it should just improve the performance of the GPU. And we also see a streamlined graphics pipeline, which is optimized for, quote, performance per clock and higher clock speed. I was also told that uh, with Narve, one of the design goals was to fix the issues that were prevalent in older GCN iterations. So, for example, improve geometry performance, improve pixel pushing power, and from the leak that we saw on Twitter, assuming that's accurate, of course, it looks like that has largely come to pass. It's going to be really interesting what uh, Microsoft tell us at E3, which is obviously in just a couple of weeks' time. I don't think that Lisa holding this stuff back was an accident. I do think some of it is to do with the consoles. In fact, I think a large amount of it is to do with the consoles. And I do have this, um, this burning question in my mind of like, okay, 
let's take the T-flops out of the equation for a moment, like, forget the T-flops. What the heck are the differences between the Xbox version of the GPU and the PlayStation version of the GPU? We've heard multiple times, although whether it's true, no one knows, that Microsoft's version of the GPU is, quote, more advanced, but that doesn't mean much, because more advanced without us having any context for the advancements doesn't mean a damn thing. Anyway, I think that just about covers it for this video. Normal stuff, if you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to the channel, because that helps us out a ton. I'd also like to thank each and every one of you who are recent subscribers for clicking that subscribe button. It helps us out, and it also feels really kind of humbling that we're already so close to 62,500 subs. I know, once again, we're very small compared to, like, Learner's Tech Tips or whomever, but for me, it's just... I don't know, it's just really bizarre to uh, see so many subscribers. So once again, I'd just like to thank you for all of that support and also for reaching out to us on social media and emails and all of the other bits and pieces. You can also email me over tips at paul at redgamingtech.com. That is paul at redgamingtech.com. But I'm going to let you all go. You take care of yourselves. Bye for now.